Football is a happening. From current players who make history to the legends of the game, heroes who help define it. With unique stories built on pride and classic moments from many years past. 68 10, wing back out. Geo for a This is family. This is home for us. This is life. I gotta follow my dreams, I gotta chase them. This is their story. It is a massive tornado making its way in through the Tuscaloosa area. I'm say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I think I feel uh, at home. The moment that you figure out this game has nothing to do with skill and it's about will, well, nobody beats you. It's Haviland's Football Saturday. <laughs> Coming up on this show, we take a trip to Cincinnati to visit A.J. Green, one of the best receivers in the NFL. Football returns to UAB. We'll show you the incredible story of how a community pressured the university to bring back football. Kawan Short is a star in the NFL, but he had some challenges growing up as we head to East Chicago. And we'll tell you the significance of the number 25 at Virginia Tech. It was truly a magical last season. Welcome to the Emmy Award-winning Haviland's Football Saturdays. We knew there were great days ahead for A.J. Green when he was a three-sport star at Somerville High School in South Carolina. It was validated after a stellar career at the University of Georgia. While he has gone on to become a superstar for the Cincinnati Bengals, A.J.'s had to overcome personal tragedy to find peace in his life. What are you feeling? As a crowd screams as I emerge from the smoke. The feeling of record-setting performances. The feeling of an amazing catch. Looking for Green. What a catch! Touchdown, Georgia! Wow! Even losing loved ones. I say, AJ, we are the Okay. But when I'm holding the most important blessing I ever received. <laughs> there's truly no greater feeling than to be a father. On July 31st, 1988, in the small town of Ridgeville, South Carolina, Adriel Jeremiah Green was born. Well, he always was a, like a quiet child, but like his cousin said, he could do things nobody else could do. And growing up, you know, I played in the backyard, played basketball, we played football after school every day. We throw the ball, football a couple times, and we'd get out there and play around a little while until I get tired. <laughs> but he never got tired, he just loved it. They was playing, I think, low water getting high. You know, you ever heard of that rope game? It was like that high. And AJ jumped that rope without even touching it. And my dad said, one day that boy is gonna be something. Y'all mock what I said. AJ's love between he and his older brother, Aviance, was special. Having the two boys, AJ was very small. Avi just picked him up and kissed him to death. When Avi go to school or when he heard the bus, he would run to the home, run to the bus stop. Avi would tow him all the way home. Avi would fix him something to eat there. We're always close. Avi played baseball for at least three years and he loved it. Hit a home run, Avi, hit a home run. <laughs> Uh, they're my two boys, loved them to death, and I was proud of them. On April 17th, 1993, their lives would change forever. They were on their way at a carnival at school, and somebody ran them off the road. But the person said that something was in the road, so she swerved to keep from hitting it. And that's when they, my sister lost control of the car. 
I passed everything on the way coming home. The ambulance, the everything dealing with it. Policemen, I passed right everything. And then my sister came, my older sister came and she said, I believe I've been in a bad accident. When I got when I got to the hospital, I got I wanted to see AJ. I said, AJ, where's the Arby? And he just said, I tried to get Arby, but Arby won't wake up. I tried to get him, but he won't wake up. Okay. My mom cried every day. Um, um, and my dad didn't know what to do. I had no stretches. My aunt got paralyzed from the waist down. And, you know, my brother got killed. And, and you know, every day I wake up, I'm like, why me? You know, I, I, I shouldn't been here. You know, we're a very close family, and we understand that sometimes we don't understand, but God always has a plan. And um, it's not a, you know, sometimes we don't understand it. Um, but you have that faith that, you know, he's doing the right things, and he has a plan. Um, so that's how, we, that's how we look at things. Football soon became AJ's passion. The five-star wide receiver finished his career at Somerville High School with over 5,000 yards and 62 touchdowns and was one of the best prospects in the nation. For me, I just wanted to find something that I was very passionate about. Um, and then one day I decided, like, Mom, I want to go for try out for uh, a football team. And then it took off from there. You know, I started uh, from day one playing receiver and then JV and then Varsity and then it took off. I was afraid uh, he was going to get hurt because what he would do, if the quarterback threw one over his head, he'd still try to catch it and he'd reach out and hit the ground. Rolling, throwing, touchdown, A.J. Green! I mean, going back to recruitment, he was the low, he, lowest maintenance guy. I want to come to Georgia, that's it. Then he shows up and he's, he's, he's the greatest wide receiver that I've ever seen in person. And, uh, and I've seen some really good ones in person. Stands up, fires over the middle, touchdown, A.J. Green! Drafted fourth overall by the Cincinnati Bengals in 2011, A.J. married his college sweetheart. Well, you know, me and Miranda met going into my sophomore year and then it took off from there. So now we've been dating for nine years, going on 10. It's unbelievable for the feeling to find that one person, your best friend, she's my best friend, tell her anything. Um, and we have this special connection that, you know, can't be described. A year ago, the couple got exciting news that they would be welcoming a new baby boy. I know he calls me, he said, Mom, guess what? I said, what? I'm gonna be a dad. I was like, ah! I was screaming and yelling and then <laughs> running around the house. <laughs> Oh, and he was so excited. He said, I can't believe it, but I'm gonna be a dad. The love that they have each other, really. The way they look at each other, the way AJ just stares at him, like, wow, look what God has blessed me with. This holding on man is like, God is real. The way he looks at you, and you know, you watch him grow, um, it's an unbelievable feeling. I never thought I could love something so much. It just brightens up my day every time I get up, every time I come back home from work. He crawls to me and the smiles, and um, it's unbelievable. Just an unbelievable feeling. AJ's play with the Bengals has put him on a Hall of Fame pace, but he understands his real job is at home. At the end of the day, it's just a game. Um, after that, you take off those, those uniforms, you gotta go home to reality, and that's my reality is being a father. And 
that's when my real work starts. I gotta change diapers, I gotta feed them, I gotta do, do little things like that. <laughs> Every day I wake up, um, you know, I thank the Lord above because um, it's not supposed to happen to me. And growing up, you know, I lost my brother at, at the age of nine. Uh, when I was four, um, and, and, and being able to play football and have a family right now and, and everything and all my success and every time I see my son is a blessing. That's my brother. He'd be so proud of me, of, of the man I became today. What a humble guy, genuine family man. Cool fact about AJ is that he used to be a juggler. No wonder he's so great when the ball is in the air. A.J. severely injured his hamstring in week 11 last year against the Bills, but he is now healthy as the Bengals look to get back in the playoffs. The return of UAB football. It has been a long road, but they're finally ready to take the field. Their story, next on Haviland's Football Saturday. Two and a half years ago, UAB's football program was blindsided with devastating news. The university was shutting it down. The response from the UAB community was swift and loud. Bring the football program back and bring it back now. Well, six months later, the program was reinstated and this season will take the field. How it all came down is a story that hasn't been told until now. Another day of rumors and not a lot of facts. Still no comment from the administration that the school will terminate its football program. This board of trustees is hell bent on closing this program down. They want to destroy this university. That's that's the bottom line. The president is considering canceling one of the best and cheapest ways to market its university, its school. I, that just makes no sense. Football is the driving force to undergraduate growth. It wouldn't make common sense and it wouldn't make economic sense. The 2014-15 academic year will be our final year of competition in football. It's a great travesty for our city. You want to be in a campus in a major metropolitan area, no football team. And that just makes no sense. This is a big emotional issue for me as well as other alumni of the university. I am fully committed to UAB through thick and thin, always have been. Go! Go! We will not stop fighting and we want to say thank you to yourself. Thank you, UAB. CSS submits its final report and insists football can thrive. Given the broad base of support, never before seen, as of today, we are taking steps to reinstate the football rifle and bowling program. Yeah! You plan for so much more than just football. The wait, the anticipation, all the hard work that we had to do to actually get to this moment. Just so proud of them and, and, and you know, just uh, hate that we're going through this. Are you bitter? You know, it's hard not to be upset. I got coaches and families and players and it's, you know, we're, you know, we're hurt. It was terrible. I mean, I don't think there's any way around it. You know, it was terrible for guys that were leaving. Your legacy is now changed and, uh, you know, I fought to help make this a, a national team. It's kind of hard to believe that your, your team is about to be canceled. You know what I mean? Like, that's not something that you just hear every day. You know? This is a school, we're a Division I program. Like, I've never heard of that happening. No one's gonna take away a Division I program, you know? So I didn't, I didn't hear anything to, after the Southern Miss game, then when I heard it then, and then December the 2nd came around and the announcement was actually made, it was like, wow, this is a real moment, you know? I thought it was dreaming, but it was actually real. They all have to start over again. Don't know where it's, what school they're gonna go to or nothing like that. I mean, it was devastating. It was, it's not on the same level as like, someone dying, but it, it, 
you know, tears are running down everyone's faces. You know, a lot of those guys I haven't seen since, might not ever see again. And it just felt like, it felt like if, if you had a family and like a tragedy happened and then your family just split and you didn't see a lot of those people, that's, that's really what it felt like. We just leaned on each other. I feel like after that meeting, a few of the guys kind of just hung out. We just talked about stuff and then guys, start making big decisions within the next 24 hours after that uh, announcement because so many coaches were just swarming in there. If you would have been around the city, like it was mayhem because instantly all of our phones started ringing from different schools. Coaches were up here in hotels, you know, coming up to say, come see me in this room. It, it, was, it was weird, like phones were just ringing, coaches, you look around the city, go walk around campus, you'd see coaches with all these different uh, teams and gears on. A lot of schools who who pursued me and they was like, we need you to come, we want you to come now. I was like, I just can't make a decision in two, three days, like, I want to come pay for your university. I woke up out of my sleep one morning and the coach was like, can you meet me right now? I was like, I don't even know who you are. He was like, I'm, I'm, I'm outside of the library, come meet me, I want to talk to you. I was like, I mean, I guess so, I got to do that now, I don't really have anywhere to go. So Jordan Howard, I remember like, Texas called him, they were like, uh, Baylor called him. I was like, man. The day after UAB decided to end football, students continued to question the move. This is Alabama. We're in the South. This is a football state. The reasoning behind the shutdown that was published in the paper and was pretty much the communicated line was that, you know, financially the program was not viable. The Board of Trustees uh, and Dr. Ray Watts had decided that we would operate as a business and if we operated at a loss, we couldn't be here. The reason largely for the, the problems, the issues with the small crowds and the lack of success in recruiting was the facilities. And I had heard over time that the university athletics had not been supported. Most of us said, boy, that's, that's, that's a shame that it shut down. Uh, but kind of accepted the fact that it was shutting down as opposed to really looking into the real issues around it. University commissioned a report and it's been infamously known as the Carr Report. And the Carr Report was a study that was commissioned by the university to just look at the overall viability of the entire athletic department. I think there's a, a some more subjective things that need to be considered. You know, I look around and I don't really call these guys my teammates, they're more of my brothers. Um, you know, there's nothing I wouldn't do for these guys and I know they feel the same about me. And I know everyone in this room right now supports UAB and this is, this is UAB football family. The decision by UAB President Ray Watts to terminate the football program caused protests by many supporters. I tell people all the time about UAB fans that We've all got all kind of different fans, but this is, a, this is an intelligent group. UAB football is important, and it wasn't, you know, we weren't alone, there were others. You know, there were a lot of people that recognized that UAB football um, needed to come back, that we, we could raise the money. If we were gonna bring the football program back, we had to raise 18 to $20 million, and we raised that money literally from the community. In May, the UAB Football Foundation starts raising money. So far, they've raised more than $22 million. Credit needs to go to Ray Watts. He got discredited a lot. A lot of credit needs to go to Ray Watts for A, having the courage to bring football back, and, and two, really rallying the troops and rallying the Board of Trustees and working with us. Given the broad base of support never before seen, as of today, we are taking steps to reinstate the football, rifle, and bowling programs. We saw the importance of, of this game we play to this community, to these students, and I was so happy for these people who had fought so hard. And now, okay, let's give them something to really be happy about. When the announcement came back, I hear we're gonna uh, reinstate it in two years. Well, we got an uphill battle to climb. I used to think about my teammates every day. Well, I know people are going to go back. And I, I kept waiting. I waited the options for so long about, about going back or not going back. It just kind of shocks me sometimes because, you know, you get them and they come back and say, hey, everything we talked about, everything you said, for them to believe that and see that, um, you know, that means, that means everything to me because that's why we do this. Let's go.
First, you gotta become a team for real. Cause like, you know, we hadn't played in games together. Then you gotta get people to buy in. Then you gotta get leaders. Some of those guys like the leaders on the other team are still leaders on this team. Like at first, our DBs wouldn't hang out with our receivers or vice versa, you know, but now it's just everybody. Everybody clicks with everybody. It's a brotherhood. There was 22 guys on our team at one point. That's all we had. And then after a semester, a wave of guys came in. We had to take the rules as they were written for everybody else and, and build a team over a two year period. We had to focus on a facility. Then we started to hear about the blueprints of the facility. We finally got a turf practice field. We can actually practice on the field safe only. We're not here to go at each other. We're here to make history together. We're here to bond and do stuff that we've never done before. Spring practice this year has a whole new meaning as the countdown clock to the 2017 season opener is more real than ever. Our goal is to continue the momentum that we have with the community and really all the constituencies that helped to bring football back. The support that our fans and everybody gave, to, especially to bring this program back, is everything. I mean, like, without them, we don't have this program back. Without our fans and all the, the protests and everything, without our alumni coming in, chipping in, like, we don't have UAB football. The whole reason it's back is because of the city of Birmingham. The business community and the people of this community who are committed to UAB as an institution, committed to our city's well-being and for a collaborative, uh, constructive partnership to help UAB and our city really move forward and become the best it can be. This is a place that I chose to be and we chose to come here because it has got unlimited potential. Um, you know, I didn't make this a great academic institution. I didn't build Birmingham, but we're sure going to use it. Everyone who has been part of this program have been waiting for this day. Leading up to the spring game, we just didn't know what to expect. And then when we pulled up, we didn't expect to see as many people at the spring game. Like, we had to open up more parking lots for people to actually park. It was, like, amazing to, to see the support and stuff that um, people was, you know, pouring out for this program. It was like a real game day for us. It was unreal to seeing, seeing how many fans came to the walk, seeing everything. It just... I can see the look in everybody's eyes that they just, all the hard work and all the effort that we had put in was finally coming. Seeing all those people, you know, for a spring game, you know, when we first got here, there probably weren't too many people, like in the stands, period. But for a spring game, there's 8,000 people. That was probably the, the biggest joy of the whole spring day. You're not just playing for, you know, uh, just the university, you're playing for the whole city, you're playing for everyone who is fighting for you, people fighting for you on Twitter that's never been to Birmingham in their life, never been to the state of Alabama, tweeting stuff about it. You're playing for so much more than just football. I've never been through anything like this. So when I walk through the office and I see that ticking clock, it's just, it makes me so anxious. I, I'm just so ready to be back on the football field. All I've ever wanted to do in my life was win. And when we do win and I and I can I can look somebody in the eye and be like, oh yeah, I built that. You know what I mean? Like I was a part of the blueprint that brought back UAB. We're playing for our family, we're playing for the city, we're protecting something. You know, we're not we're not going in there to fight for ourselves, we're not going in there to, you know, boost up ourselves. We're we're protecting something. A lot of players when they go to college, you want to be able to, put, uh, be able to put their mark on a program. Well, this is like all of our opportunity to really put a stamp and a mark on UAB. This 17 group is going to set the standard, and I, and I want them to know that. Um, that's why we say you are playing for a lot more people than just yourself. This is your legacy. You're already winners. You know, I, I, somebody said the other day, well, you know, we need to win next year to, um, to really make this thing right. I said, well, we've already won. UAB wide receiver Colin Lisa said it best. They are playing for so much more than just football this year. And while the UAB program looks to be successful under head coach Bill Clark, this season is special. They will set the standard for all other teams to follow. 
and also redefine what it means to play for their brotherhood. It was not that easy growing up in East Chicago, Indiana, but Kawan Short made it out and is now a star in the NFL. His path to the pros and how his hometown made him into an all-pro when Haviland's Football Saturdays returns. Welcome back to Haviland's Football Saturdays. The Carolina Panthers' Kawan Short has become one of the most feared defensive linemen in the NFL. His journey to the pros began in East Chicago, Indiana, where it wasn't always easy. We followed KK back to his hometown to see how he is making a difference in his community. The most important thing that I've done, I feel like, was come back to East Chicago to show these kids the, you know, what's, what's else is to life. 12 years old, I think I was staying on um, 3585 Block Avenue. Uh, right from a danger street called Guthrie. Just in between those two blocks, uh, which is like a two block radius, you know, a lot of things went on between the streets. It was just hard, you know, just knowing every day you walk out the house, you have to watch your back or watch what's going on and watch your surroundings. It was tough, so, you know, you, you went outside with a, with a vicious thought of, you know, anything could happen. Guthrie is, is questionably the the worst street in East Chicago growing up on. Um, just a, not, a lot of negatives just feed into the youth on those blocks. Gone through the block. It's the street life from the very bottom. I mean, that's what you call the gutter, the hood. I mean, drug dealing, gang banging, people getting shot. I mean, they got so bad where Guthrie turned in from being Guthrie Avenue, they changed it to Martin Luther King Drive just to get the stigma away from the name it had maintained all the years just to come back and, and you know, smile. And, uh, these kids can be down from, from they first started school. To come back and see somebody who, who's done it before, been in that same position, and made something out of it. You know, it just gives them hope to, to do better in school and you know, just outside and off the streets. I ride past it every time I come back. I don't come back, I don't knock at the door or nothing, but you know, just as soon as I hit that corner, I just turn and I know I'm on block. It's just like, it's, it's been a long, long journey, I'll tell you that. That feeling that you get, just knowing that, you know, like you, 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 you accomplished something, like you, you've gone to something better. So it's just, you know, it's just that feeling, it's just that feeling. So it's the good old backyard right here. We had like the, the basketball court right here in the corner. When I say it used to be like 10 to 15 kids out here. I mean, just playing 31. It used to be crazy. We used to have squirrels sneak through the attic and stuff, like scratching on the walls like you hear it at night. So you're like, oh my God. It was just, you know, that's just how it was. It wasn't no trouble over here because it really wasn't like a, a bad part, but like if you go two blocks over to the basketball course was was where you saw a lot of stuff happening. So in between Guthrie and Block, you had a basketball court, which everybody goes to. And growing up, that was like my first love. And in between those courts, I saw so many things happening. You know, fights, shootouts, and police jumping out on guys with warrants and stuff like that. And again, you can be in the wrong place at the wrong time. You had like dog fights in the back there, like. It was just, it was just really cutthroat sometimes. Yeah, I was scared, but I wasn't like, I wasn't like terrified not to come out here. This was just, he was out here, every, he was out here every day, pretty much playing ball. But everywhere we went, we had a basketball in our hand. Basketball was the escape, man. I played basketball probably like. 24-7. That triangle kept me, you know, back and forth from being on the streets and being uh, in that whole life. If you think he can move bodies on the football field, put that little basketball in his hand and they're getting out of his way. Like he was a, he was a, a force that was hard to get around. I came to high school and I wasn't even going to play football. I was just going to play basketball. 
And then, you know, one of my coaches, Coach Judah Parks, he was like, well, just try it out. And if you don't like it, then you can't say you never tried it. From sophomore year, I start, you know, I start putting more effort into it and start playing better. And like, next thing you know, I was up there with the guys who was, you know, been playing since knee high. Kawan became a two-sport athlete excelling in football and winning a state championship in basketball. By junior year, Kawan gained interest from Purdue's football program, but didn't have the grades to become eligible. I committed junior year. Then after basketball, uh, Mark Hagan came and was like, uh, it's gonna be tough. You're not even in the core 40 classes that you need. You're way behind, so. Uh, if you really want to do this, it's, it's gonna it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a journey. We pulled out this like I felt like it was a booklet of you know stuff that I needed to accomplish that I needed to do. You know, take extra classes. All my classes was core, and on top of that, I had to do night school, uh, online class, and then summer school. Like it, it took nights, you know, just staying up, crying, and uh, you know, frustration uh, really kicked in, and, and and that's when it tells me like be patient and, and be poised and just to adapt to the situation that you're in. When I got accepted, you know, it was just tears of joy when I say, oh, I'm eligible now to go to Purdue. And I told myself that I wasn't going to leave until I get my degree. Kawan held himself to that promise, staying all four years at Purdue and becoming an NFL prospect by his senior season. In the 2013 draft, a dream became a reality. I hear my name across that screen. I'm just like, oh, man, like, you know, the whole room went crazy, and I almost had a heart attack, man. I was breathing so hard. Like, you know, this is this is something I dreamed for. This is something that I want to do all my life. You know, since I started playing, and you know, to make this dream happen. The journey that I went through trying to get to college, to the NFL, it became, you know, a, a second nature to me to know what I need to do to approach this and how I need to do it and what I need to do to accomplish it. He first got in. You you sort of see the flashes of, of what he could become, and. As the years have gone on, he's, he's become exactly who, who we thought he was going to be, an uh, um, unblockable force right up the middle for us. You admire KK for the, the, the work ethic that he has, um, and then you see him play, and he, he's quicker than you think. But being a basketball player, he's got some good feet for a big boy. And, and I think those are the best ones when you talk about the defensive tackles, the guys that have great feet, great hands. They're able to move in and out and make a lot of plays, and the 2015 season was really his breakout year. Kawan did break out leading the team in sacks and becoming a force for one of the top NFL defenses. The Panthers made it all the way to Super Bowl 50, and while Carolina was showing pride on the field, East Chicago was showing pride for one of their own. We wanted to give a tribute back, you know, just show our love that the Carolina Panthers were going to the Super Bowl, and our hometown guy, you know, was on that squad, so was, we wanted to show that his hometown was behind him, so we put the mural up. I mean, this when the city was behind me 100%, and he hit me up and said, I got, something, I got something to show you. And next thing you know, he sent me a picture of this. And it got big and blew up all around East Chicago, went in the papers and all that. So, I mean, it was just a, a blessing for them guys to you know, be behind me and, and just knowing the city was right there with me. On the field, Kawan continued his success from last season, becoming one of the highest paid defensive tackles in the NFL. But his priority isn't just football. It's giving back to the youth of his hometown in a variety of ways. He's one we know that's on TV, we're going to support him. But what about the people that don't watch TV? What about the people that don't watch football? How, how are you going to tap into those kids that don't like football? Just by default, being a face in the community. Just because I'm in a whole other state doing one of my dream jobs, that I'm not too good to come back and, and just sit down and talk with these kids or have this conversation with these kids and, and, and help these kids out. You know, the most important thing is Right now is the, is the time you start. Right now is the time you do everything you need to do to become successful in the classroom to order to make it. You know, everybody does sports. You want to be that basketball player, this doctor, whatever you want to be. But without school, you can't be nothing. And without school, without education, you can't succeed in life. He has the youth football camp. He have some of his buddies, the NFL buddies come in, help out with the camp. The kids absolutely love it. And everything he does, he makes sure he's there. He does college tours with the students. He takes kids down to Purdue. He's putting a face with the name. And by him taking time out of his life to show these kids that he care for their well-being, that they may not be getting at home, it, it encourages them to do better. 
The only reason why, man, because I haven't had it when I was growing up, and that was something that I always wanted. I wanted to be able to go to somebody camp or without paying, or be able to, you know, take these field trips to different schools, or be able to just get out the city in general. Uh, you know, a lot of people are not fortunate to do that. To show these kids the, you know, what's, what's else is to life. As far as getting out of East Chicago, you gotta be committed to, to have success and, and, and stay humble and, and embrace the journey. It's gonna be a challenge, but you gotta be committed to, to take on this challenge that, that you're gonna be successful. Kawan signed a five-year deal with the Panthers worth $80 million this past offseason, making him one of the highest paid defensive players in the NFL. KK knows the responsibility that he has and is now helping not only East Chicago, but also his adopted hometown of Charlotte. The number 25 was worn by a legend at Virginia Tech. And last year, Hokey fans saw it come alive again. We'll explain next on Haviland's Football Saturday. Welcome back to Haviland's Football Saturdays. Several prominent programs have found in recent years that replacing a legend can be a difficult task. But such was not the case in Blacksburg this past season after head coach Frank Beamer retired. Much of the credit for the smooth transition of power at Virginia Tech goes to new head coach Justin Fuente, who devised a unique way to keep Beamer ball alive even without Frank on the sidelines. We wanted to do something to pay tribute to Coach Beamer. You know, and as we just kind of spitballed ideas back and forth, we came up with, let's, let's alternate the number 25 with the special teams player. Coach Beamer earned such a great reputation as a special teams coach. Some new coaches coming in that kind of almost want to like, I want to write my own program, you know what I'm saying? And what he did with that is definitely saying like, I want to honor the past. John Belen, yeah, assistant athletic director, Word came through him that they were thinking about doing that. Oh, I was uh, honored uh, for sure. My retirement, uh, I could not have been treated better. I can't think of any more fitting tribute to Coach B. Uh, the number 25 here at Virginia Tech means an awful lot. When I heard that, uh, you know, I thought it was great for the program just to, you know, show honor and respect to Coach Beamer and what he did. And, uh, for me, I thought, you know, I wanted to be the first one to wear 25. You know, the fans were excited, but the thing I was most proud of is how excited our kids are about it. And then to add to it, you know, the guys wearing 25 have made some big plays, which is, uh, you know, even fueled the fire as well. When we, we have our team meeting and I announce who wears 25, I usually have something that I bring up with the person that's going to get it. Wearing number 25 today is Greg Stroman. That is in honor of former coach Frank Beamer, the legend. But in this one, I was, it was going to be Greg, and I wanted to make sure I made two points. One, you don't need to force it, but I also said uh, when you take 25 and you put it in the end zone, you know, the place is gonna go absolutely bananas. And, you know, I didn't call the shot, not quite Babe Ruth style, but we alluded to it and it happened. Strowman, 25. When they see them punting to him, and we see how much, how much grass he had in front of him, I was like, oh, he has to score in this one. Weaving his way up the middle of the field. Strowman continues. Scoring in lane is, is, is crazy. That was my first time scoring in lane, so it was just the whole run. I could feel like the crowd was just like a, like a rumble in there. It's just a joy. And uh, I knew I had a 25 on, and I just wanted to let Beams know that I, we're representing them. Beamer ball back here in Blacksburg is a special teams touchdown. To see 25 out there and to see 25 doing well, uh, it gave me a lot of pleasure. I enjoyed watching him go to the end zone. So excited and happy, you know, it's like it's happening, it's happening, it's happening. And to know Greg, too, how much pride he had in that and his feelings for coach, and then to see the, the, the crowd go bananas was, was pretty neat.
pretty much everybody except the few recruits that Coach Fuente added at the very end of last year's class were brought here or came here because of Coach Beamer. So an opportunity for them to continue their relationship with him or why they're here, or why they're Hokies, or to add to it with a play on the field. You can certainly see that there's been something magical about the guy that's been wearing it week to week. Well, Cam Phillips, you know, made a big play in the North Carolina game. Divine Diablo wore 25 and on the opening kickoff at Pitt. Uh, flew down there and caused a fumble, you know, set the tone for the ball game. So it's been pretty special. What I was most happy, it seemed like whoever wore 25 really had a good ball game. So, uh, you know, maybe it brought a little luck to that team too. It's almost like that jersey just makes you turn it up a little bit more and say, like, I'm going to do everything I can to make something happen. You know, you always hope that something like that happens, you know, but it's exceeded my, my expectations. It's been everything that I'd hoped it would be, but wasn't sure that it would be. The magic of the 25 jersey was never more evident than in the Hokies' final game of the regular season. Senior fullback Sam Rogers, a former walk-on, ran for 100 yards for the first time in his career and rushed for two touchdowns against in-state rival Virginia while wearing Coach Beamer's number. Emmy Award-winning Havilands, Football Saturdays, we'll be right back. On our next show, we head to Miami to visit with Hurricane head coach Mark Rick and Chestnut Hill to get together with BC head coach Steve Adazio. In Myrtle Beach, we'll find Hunter Renfro, a walk-on who has become a Clemson legend. To check out exclusive videos from this show and past stories from our series, go to footballsaturdays.com. For our entire Raycom Sports staff, I'm Tim Brando. So long, everybody.